I am so delighted to be joined by Eleanor Coppola here at Francis Ford Coppola Winery in Geyserville. Hi, Eleanor. Nice to see you. Hi. I read somewhere that you get about 200,000 or so visitors a year. And a lot of times people think about tons of visitors and they think about Napa or even maybe Maine Sonoma, but we're up here a little bit. Healdsburg and uh, Geyserville. Why did you decide to make this winery up here a big place for families? It was certainly a risky choice when Francis uh, decided to develop this winery here. In our other winery in Napa, we had a fountain, and in the summertime, the little kids would like jump in the fountain, and then they'd have to say, no, 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 you can't. And they'd say, why not? And so it occurred to Francis that they really want to be in the water, especially in the hot summer up here, and why not have swimming pools? Of course, it had never been done before, and so there are a lot of hoops to jump through. We put a lot of movie memorabilia here that uh, people are interested in. So it's just a kind of place that we think families would enjoy because we enjoy it and our family comes here. I don't know that people realize how long you've been in wine country. Can you talk a little bit about your history and why you decided to live the, the wine country life, I guess? We had small children and the idea of the summers in San Francisco are just no fun. I was you putting your, you know, the down jacket on my kids in, yeah. <laughs> all, in yeah. July, all summer long. Yeah. And um, anyway, Francis thought, well, we should drive to the Napa Valley and see if we could get a little summer house and uh, you know, with an acre of grapes and make some home wine. And then our real estate agent um, took us to the old Inglenook property. He said, this is not for you, it's not what you're looking at, but it'll probably only be on the market once in our lifetime. And we should just drive through and have a look. Only because Francis had just gotten a check from Godfather, which was so unexpected in our lives and just um, made it possible for us to make a bid. We ended up with it in 1975. And um, then we went to the Philippines to make Apocalypse Now. And we actually moved in in 1977. And it was a very different time. There were about 45 wineries in the valley, and now I hear there are close to 800. A completely different atmosphere there that we're always uh, trying to adjust to. You're one of these really unique people that, in life, you and Francis, and with your family, with your career, you've succeeded success in both an industry in the wine industry, which is, I interview winemakers, you know, for years, hundreds of them, it's a very hard industry to succeed in. And the film industry, obviously, a very difficult industry. And you've managed to, to succeed in both, and then obviously m many other endeavors. And I'm wondering here, being someone who's sitting here next to you, what does it look like to be on the other side of that? Well, Francis has this vision, you know, and he just, uh, he just gets determined to see his vision through, you know, whether sometimes it's maybe almost not wise. During Apocalypse Now, there were plenty of times of desperation. I just said, well, why don't you just quit? We can go back, and this is not the end of life. You can make another film, you know? And he just has his determination to see something through that he's envisioned. And uh, so these are really uh, his, his visions that uh, he's developed. And, and it never feels like, oh my gosh, we've just been so successful here and there, because his vision is always further ahead. And uh, so he's investing in, he, he never has this sort of abundance of money because it's already spread out into this next, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, people think, oh, they must be so rich. I mean, we live very simply, well, that's, simply and uh, and our life focuses around the creative endeavors of the family and that sort of comes first and and there's uh, it takes a lot of money to do a lot of these uh, different endeavors in fact people always say that the way to make a small fortune in the wine industry is to start with a large one <laughs> and I think that's true for many we're blessed that this uh, took off and that we were also in a period uh, in the United States when wine drinking uh, really boomed, blossomed, they're, they're just the number of people who drink wine now are far exceed uh, what they were when we came into this industry, and, and we're uh, the beneficiaries of that. And we have a couple of wines that are claret from this winery that um, has been a very popular and solid backbone of the of the uh, you know portfolio. So. It's being in it for a long time and, uh, and just 
continuing to invest and develop and develop these new products. And it's not like we're just sort of sitting here on the I said you should kick back, drink wine, eat bonbons all day. That's clearly not happening. <laughs> oh, that's not happening. <laughs> we have three wines in front of us. We have the Sophia here, and we have a hashtag collection by Gia, which mm -hmm. is your granddaughter. Sophia is your daughter. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Eleanor, which is you, Eleanor, <laughs> made for you by Francis uh, on your uh, 50th wedding anniversary, if I'm correct. I'm looking at these wines and I'm seeing these are literally looking like the representatives of your of your family. And that's, mm -hmm. is that sort of the, th the theme for you all here? No, definitely. If it has the family a name on it, it has to be a, a wine that that uh, individual really likes. And um, my wine, for instance, is a blend of Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. And I, uh, Syrah is my, one of my favorite red wines. And uh, I think it's improved with a, with the blend that uh, the winemaker worked on. And I had fun developing that wine, tasting it, and and I designed the label, and, and it just, uh, that was a really good project. And it, I felt like after all the, <laughs> all the wines named after Francis, it was fun to <laughs> have my own wine. And of course, Sophia is, is very much involved with the, her wines and the tasting of the wines, the coloration, the amount of uh, effervescence. And, and I know Corey Beck is your winemaker, and mm -hmm. but I had read an article that Corey had said that Sophia was talking about putting wine in a can over 15 years ago. So she's been a little bit of a, a, a trailblazer in that regard. And that is a very popular wine for you all. Not that that's this wine, but it's an, another one of her wines. Mm -hmm. She had a business in Japan and she traveled there frequently, which was the underpinnings of uh, Lost in Translation. And in Japan, they have all these vending machines with all these little cans, cans of tea, cans of everything. And, and I think uh, that spurred the idea of how about a wine in a can. This is one of the first ones on the market, though. Yeah. It really uh, was kind of a trailblazer. And Gia was really working toward a wine that millennials at her age group would be uh, drawn to. And, and this kind of larger oversized bottle and the cap that um, can just flip off and actually you can Press it back on if you need to, but it's it's fun to to see her expressing her uh, her interests and and what she thinks would her friends would like to drink with her. I know you said this is a wine for millennials, but my three year old twins are. We have a bottle of this at home, and this is the cat wine. So okay, they're very so the three year olds are very excited oh, good. about this wine. Not yeah, drinking it, of course. We are very PC, but um, they love they love the photos as well. And I imagine for you, that's got to for you and Francis. This must be really fun. I mean, to have your family involved and to have your granddaughter sort of uh, taking the, this uh, new kind of next gen wine and, and running with it. Yeah, no, we're really pleased to have our children take an interest and be drawn into it because, of course, we hope that the wine companies will go on after after we pass. But uh, their involvement is uh, is I think it's interesting for them and good for us, and it's just a nice family endeavor, and it also is a common ground that we all talk about and discuss and work toward. Yeah, and um, speaking of women, we have this really fun Great Women Spirits collection, and this is so unique because I don't think I've seen anything like this, but you all have sort of the women that weren't mentioned in the history books. It's all of Francis's idea. He's a voracious reader, and he read about some of these women, and he read more about them, and then and he wanted to... Um, bring them to the fore. And you're obviously working, you're creative in your own right. You've done, you know, documentaries and you've got a film coming up. My big endeavor was to, uh, it took me six years to raise the money to make a film called Paris Can Wait that came out last year. And it was uh, just a wonderful adventure. It gave me a lot of compassion for the rest of the family and their, uh, the work they do in filmmaking because it is so difficult. I mean, everybody says that, but it, I can guarantee you it's true. But uh, I was very happy to get to do that. And now I'm more interested in, uh, I've made a couple of short films and I'm preparing a third one, which I'll probably join together in uh, you know, a feature length uh, piece. And I heard you say a few times, and I don't know if this quote's still true because it's been a year or so, uh, that only 7% of the films are made or directed are made by women. Is that? That's right, in, yeah. That's, in, mm -hmm. that's the heartbreaking truth that, uh, and I know from my own experience, uh, my film went across a lot of bankers' desks and financiers' desks 
who are primarily men, and uh, it has no, in, in their view, no action, no violence, no car chases, nobody dies, there's no guns, there's no kidnappings. They're, to them, it just seems like no, nothing happening. Who'd want to see this? But I felt strongly that there was um, a whole group of people who uh, are out there looking for something else that's not being provided by the industry. That There are a lot of us women, I say, <laughs> men like my film too, but it's primarily focused on women who are 50, 45 plus years. And there just isn't much material that is uh, made for that uh, demographic. And uh, so I set out to create something that would fit in that. Yeah. Be a film I wanted to see that that you didn't have to come away with deep thoughts and suffering and upset and uh, emotional angst. That it was just that something that was really fun to yeah. see and enjoy. We're kind of in this moment of time for women, you think? I don't know. I, my, I was talking to a girlfriend on the phone and she was like, it feels like the tree branches are shaking. And I hear you say this and mm -hmm. I think about that. Uh, and I'm wondering, where do you think we go from here? Well, I think we're in a huge moment of upheaval. You know, uh, there was a great deal of upheaval in the 1800s when we shifted from the agrarian society to the industrial revolution. There were riots and upset and lots of um, concern and torment and misery and people left behind. And now we're in a new moment when we're shifting from the industrial age to the technological age. And again, we're in this very disruptive moment. And uh, I think out of that is going to come something very positive. So I'm not seeing it as all bad, but it is very uh, uncomfortable to go through. And of course, I think a lot of the shift is the fact that women are coming to the fore for the first time in history, that they can do the same things that men can do. So I think it's just a matter of time before there's this more even uh, acceptance of uh, men and women in the workplace and men, men and women in life. And I see a big uh, transition from myself and my generation to my daughter's generation. Whereas I married an Italian man with a very traditional idea of that the woman uh, creates a nice home and takes care of the kids and supports the husband. And uh, you know, I had creative dreams of my own and they really had to take a side <laughs> sidelined during that period because uh, just didn't fit with, and especially Francis had a very active career and we traveled to all of his locations and so on. But I see my daughter, she, she's having a full career. She has two children. Her husband has a full career. They're, uh, they totally accept that about each other and uh, he, he's part of a, a band that tours and so uh, she, he stays home when she's going on location sometimes, and he uh, and she takes care of the kids when he's on tour. I mean, they, they have found a balance of how they can both have a rich, fulfilling life, a creative life, and a family, and, and uh, it's just a different, very different time. Well, that's something to drink to, for sure. I have to raise my glass and toast to, <laughs> to you with the Eleanor. Do you have a cheers or a toast anything you all say around the house? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, Francis is one, is that when you toast, you have to really look in someone's eyes, not just, because people, you know, they kind of toast yeah. and they're talking. And, yeah, yeah. No, you look in each other's eyes. If you don't, it's seven years bad sex. No. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah, no, that, really, that really gets people's attention yeah, to yeah. look in their eyes. <laughs> yeah.